Amen. Hallelujah. Let's just pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks so much. We thank you. We acknowledge your goodness. We acknowledge your love, your loving kindness, your tender mercies of us. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of, to come into your presence with worship. We do not come timidly, scared, afraid. We come boldly, like your word has urged us to, to, pray, to come. We come knowing that we are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We come with the full freedom, full right and access of children, knowing that you are Father. And we rejoice in that. We brag on the cross. We refuse to brag on ourselves, on anything we have done or not done. Our boast, our brag is on you. We give you thanks. We rejoice. Thank you for us. We come to your word. We come reverently. Thank you for you will open our eyes to see wondrous things out of your, your law. We pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation, like Paul prayed, yes. to be upon us, that we may see the hope of your calling even more. The riches of the glory of your inheritance in us as saints, the exceeding greatness of your power toward us who believe. The same power that raised up our Lord Jesus from the dead. We also pray that we'll be filled more today with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That at the end, the name of Jesus will be glorified. Thank you for manifestations of the Holy Ghost as you will, as your spirit wills. We pray that um, the work of the ministry will have been more done today. The saints will have been more mature today. The church more edified today. We will have come even more to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and to a mature man. We pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So uh, I think it was fitting that the songs that we sang, at least two of them, um, talked about the goodness of God, God's nature, God's goodness. And um, while I'm going to talk about prayer today, I think it, my sermon could easily also have been titled The Goodness of God. It was very fitting. Hallelujah. So I'm going to talk about prayer today. And I, I want to warn you ahead. <laughs> I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures. I always do. A lot of scriptures. So get ready, set, go. <laughs> get ready. So um, let's start from Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Um, actually, Luke, let's do Luke 18. They're pretty much the very close, same thing. Luke 18. Now, before we um, read, you can open it and stay there. Before we go there and read, you, can see, you will notice that the Lord Jesus, when he began um, his ministry, for example, in Matthew chapter 5, when he began to speak to people, when he, okay, so he, he went, he went uh, and got baptized. John the Baptist baptized him. Then he went into the wilderness. Then he came out of the wilderness after the 40 day fast and he began to preach. The Bible says, the fame of him went forth, you know. And it also says that he began to do the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. Blessed are they, the peacemakers. Blessed, blessed are they who seek. And thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. He began to say all those things. We call it the Beatitudes. Then you have, after that, you have what, we, what is now called the Sixth Thesis. You have heard it said, but I say unto you. you. You heard it said, I say unto you. Six times he said those things. And in the middle of that, he began to say stuff like, I want you to take note. He began to say stuff like, in the middle of that, he said, look at the lily of the, uh, the grass of the field. Look at the fowls of the air. They don't toil. They don't do gourmet cooking. And yet God feeds them. Amen. And then he made a little phrase there and he said, How much more you, O ye of little faith? He said that thing like twice. One for the grass of the field, one for the birds of the air. He said, God feeds them. He said, O ye of little faith, how much more you? In other words, he was really trying to convince us about God's nature, God's character. In other words, God cares for you, God cares for me. You just don't know it was trying to correct us there. How much more you, how much more your heavenly father will take care of you? That was the thing. So now with that in mind, let me take you to Luke 11. <laughs> I said 18. Let's start at 11. I'm going to go to 18 shortly also. Luke 11. So Luke 11 in verse 1, this is the Lord Jesus. Uh, the Bible says here he was praying somewhere, and one of the disciples came to him. Look at it. Luke 11 verse 1, the very first verse. And it came to pass that as he was praying, so he was praying the Lord Jesus in his hiding place. 
when he stopped praying, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Which kind of will um, imply that you, you should not assume that you know how to pray. You really should not assume that you know how to pray. You know, this is a Jew, a disciple of the Lord Jesus, asking this question. Please teach me how to pray. So in other words, I've seen the Lord Jesus. I've seen him get results. He will go and pray all night. He will always get results. This guy is saying, I don't think I get results. So there's something I need to know about, um, to get about prayer. You see, most of the time today, you and I, a lot of people today, we pray about things. We don't get an answer or a result. We forget it. Or we say, it must not have been God, God's will. God did not want to give it to me. We say, God knew that something was going to happen in the future, and God said, no, I'm not giving it to you. We do not examine it. We do not go back to God and say, but I prayed about that thing. So here it says, teach us to pray. And the Lord Jesus said, ha, 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 I don't, I'm not teaching you. <laughs> no, that's not what he said. In verse 2, immediately he did not break breath. He said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. I think it's very critical to note that every time, pretty much every time, like 95% of the times that the Lord Jesus talked about prayer like this, he was talking of, he always referred to God as Father. Our Father. In other words, when we pray, we come with the freedom that my kids will have with me. I mean, I can sit down there, they're going to climb over my head when they were younger. <laughs> they, will, they will not, no restriction, no fear. No timidity. They just come and call, Daddy, can I have this? I want ice cream. Daddy, can I? Daddy? And they cannot ask enough. They get, they, like I say, but you have just had ice cream five minutes ago, but I want more. Not afraid to ask? Can I have um, lollies or freezes? But you just had two. They just come. They just ask. They just come freely with all the freedom. In using the, the phrase Father, our Father again and again and again and again and again and again and again. In saying, look at the, leaf, the grass of the field. Look at the fowls of the air. In saying that, he, he is implying that we can come. We must come, should come to God's presence with that same kind of freedom that our children come with to us. Actually, eventually in this chapter, we're going to read it. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father? You know, in other words, he's not even comparing my love for my children to God's love. He's actually saying that my love for my children is nothing compared to God's love for me, for us. So I can come with that freedom. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is um, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That is um, verse 4. And then it goes on and on. So everybody here, I assume, will know the Lord's Prayer to the end. The, um, there's, a, there's a version in Matthew, Matthew chapter 6. This is a, the Luke version. The Matthew version goes a bit longer than this. But if you look at verse 5, he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? So the mistake we made sometimes, many times, is that Look at the Lord's Prayer, for example. When we read the Lord's Prayer, we just stop at Amen. Yeah, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. But the Bible, the Lord Jesus did not stop speaking there. The conver look at it. It's still, in my Bible, it's still red letter. The rest, of his, the rest of it continues. But we stop at Amen and forget it. The question is, what did he say? What did he continue to say after Amen. Whatever he kept, continue to, I mean, he kept saying after the amen has to be relevant. Mm -hmm. So look at it in verse 5. It continues here. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend? And shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, can I borrow three loaves? Verse 6. And the friend, uh, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set out before him. In other words, I need help. I'm asking. I'm, this is like prayer. And he, <coughs> the guy who has the bread, from within shall say, don't trouble me. It's too late. My wife is sleeping. The door is closed. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. The, look at verse 8. I say unto you, although he will not give, rise and give him because he is his friend, at least because of his importunity, he will come and say, how many do you want? Importunity means shamelessness. 
just come and ask. Somebody knocks on your door 2 a.m. and says, I need help. Even if you don't like the guy, even if you like neighbor you don't talk to, but the guy says, help me, I need help at 2 a.m., you will be like, oh, okay, he must really need it if he came at 2 a.m. He knows I'm sleeping, at least he will come. I mean, I, I, just, I, I will give it to him. Importunity there means shamelessness, it means audacity, it also means persistence, it means boldness to come. In other words, when we come to God, what the Lord is actually trying to say here is, when you come to God, ask anything. Don't be timid. Don't say, he doesn't have time for me. He will answer you. Look at the next verse. I say unto you, this is where um, Robert meets the road here. I say unto you, ask, it shall be given unto you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Many times we read these kind of verses and we say, ask, maybe God will give it to you. God might say yes. God might say no. God might say come back. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? But we say it. We have that kind of mentality. And we say something like, oh, but maybe God knows something in the future and God did not give it to me. I, I don't see that here. I don't see where the Bible says God might say yes. God might say no. God might say two years time. I don't see that here. Ask, it shall be given. I think it's, I mean, usually we say it's, black, it's in black and white. It's in red and white in my Bible. <laughs> Which means the Lord Jesus himself said it. Ask, it shall be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. Look at verse 11. If a, man, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask for a fish, will he give him a fish for a serpent? I will not do that, God forbid. And most fathers will not do that if they're in their right minds. Oh, look at verse um, 12. If you shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Verse 13. If you then be evil, you know how to give freezes <laughs> to your children, how much more your heavenly father? Essentially, he's saying that your heavenly father, look, your love for your children is sacrosanct. Yes, it's, it cannot be broken. But God's love for you is greater than that still. That's what he's saying there. Now, hold your finger there. Let's go to Luke 18 now. We now go to Luke 18. Now, what's the big picture that the Lord Jesus is trying to paint here? The big picture is God loves you. God's nature. God's character. God's goodness toward you. God's willingness to answer prayer. God's desire to answer prayer. That is the big picture here. Look at verse 18. So, my thought is this in my head. He started talking about prayer in, in Luke 11. We just read it, all that um, stuff. I think, this is, just, this is nothing in scripture. This, this is just my head. I think he just thought, you know what? I think I should repeat some of these things about prayer in verse, seven, in verse 18. So seven chapters later, after verse 11, chapter 11, he's coming here to chapter 18 and pretty much appears to be out of the blue. The blue he says in verse 18, um, chapter 18, verse 1. Look at it. And he spoke a parable unto them. For what? Why did he speak the parable? To this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. One version says, men ought always to pray and not to give up. Another one says, men ought always to pray and not to turn out badly. <laughs> so in other words, if there is trouble, pray. If there is no trouble, pray. We should be praying. Look at it, verse 2. Another parable. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city also. And she came unto him saying, avenge me of my enemies, or of my adversary. In other words, let's call it prayer. This woman was praying to this judge. She's a widow. She needed help. She needed his help. And it was in his power to help her, to help him. I mean, to help her. And he has not done it. Look at it. Verse 4. And he will not do it for a while. Why? Because he's a wicked judge. We just read it. Because he's a bad man. Which feared not God, nor regarded man. He did not do it for a while, verse 4, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow is a pain, troubles me, I will avenge her, or I will answer her prayer, lest by her continual way coming she weary me. I think, <laughs> okay, so look at the next verse, verse 6. And the Lord said, did you hear what the unjust judge said? In other words, you should underline that in your Bible. 
Because <laughs> he's, he's calling attention to it. Did you hear what that woman said? I mean, that judge said? In other words, this wicked, unjust man who did not care for God, this is, the, this is your mafia boss who doesn't care about anything. Who will say about his enemy, you know what? <laughs> Go and kill that person. No conscience. Finally, this guy, this judge finds a tiny little modicum, tiny little atom of pity, of annoyance, of mercy in his heart. Found something there. Something crept into his heart and said, just give this woman whatever she wants because she was a pain. I imagine that the woman will have come to, her, to his office every day with a placard in front of the house or she will have come, send him an email every day, something like that. Never let him rest. Now, this man finally said, okay, I'm going to give her what she wants. Look at verse 7. The Lord said, did you hear what the unjust judge said? Because as wicked as he was, as unrighteous as he was, as godless as he was, he finally said, I will do it. So he probably would have called the woman into his office and said, woman, what do you want exactly? That's what you want. Where's the paper? Sign the paper. Here's the paper. Get out. Never come here. Never. If, if we come to this office again, jail. Don't let me see you again. What's the point? <laughs> what, what is the Lord Jesus saying here? Now, let me tell you what we have thought many years. A lot of people have thought this verse says. For example, I had somebody say, you know, the way your children come and bother you, if you go to the, like a, the mall and you pass it in front of a, uh, maybe Walmart, a store, and they bug you and say, Daddy, buy this toy for me. Daddy, Daddy, I want this toy. Daddy, Mommy, I want this toy. Finally, eventually you say, okay, all right, okay, I'll buy it. The annoyance factor. <laughs> like, somebody said, we should pray like that. That's what somebody got out of this parable. We should annoy God, quote unquote, annoy God to the point that, God, pray and pray and pray. Storm the gates of heaven. Pray, pray. Don't stop praying. Keep praying. One day, God will answer you. Don't give up prayer. Keep pray All night. Six hours all night. Finally, he will answer you. The annoyance factor. If you don't give up your prayer, God will finally say, this boy has been praying for two years. <laughs> then I will now give him, God will now, because of your, because God wants to see you persistent. Like you really want what you're praying for. God will finally, because of that, answer your prayer. But that's not, the, that's the exact opposite of what the Lord Jesus is saying here. Look at it yourself. Look at verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect? In other words, God is not like that wicked George. In other words, God will answer you. God, okay, the only reason, <laughs> the only reason why this woman had to be persistent and pray and pray and pray and pray for this judge to answer her was because the judge was wicked. That's right. Was because he was an, a godless, unrighteous man. And God is not like that. It is comparison by contrast. Mm -hmm. That's what the Lord Jesus is doing here. Look at it. Shall not God, will God be like the wicked George? That's the point. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bears long with them. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 is the most critical, for me, is the most critical verse in this parable. I tell you. I. Who is I? Jesus. Me. I'm telling you. In other words, truly, truly, I say unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. In other words, I swear by myself. I tell you. He will avenge them or he will have answered their prayer. How? How? I want to hear you. How? Speedily. Speedily. Another version says swiftly. Another version says immediately. Another one says quickly. He will answer your prayer quickly. We say, God might say yes. God might say no. God might say in 20 years time, I will give it to you. This is not what the Bible says here. It says in verse 8, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth. Look at the last part of verse 7, which I think um, my brother some people. It bothered me for a, for a few years, actually. Look at what it says. Let me read all, the whole of verse 7. Look at the last part of it. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bears along with them. That part that says 
he bears long with them, it's easy for us to say, well, maybe he might bear long and not answer immediately. If that was true, then verse 8 will not be true. Verse 8 says immediately, says he will answer them speedily. So when he says they are bear long with them, it cannot be the same thing. Now, I checked other versions of this for that verse. Another, one, another version says, is he going to be slow to help them? It's a rhetorical question. In other words, he's not slow to, uh, to answer the, um, the prayer. Will he keep putting them off? Another one says. Another one says, will he delay to help them or to answer them? And they're all rhetorical questions. He will not. God answers prayer. The, the big picture is this. This is the big picture. Our appraisal, our um, appreciation of God's nature, of God's goodness, is what the Lord Jesus is talking about here. And another word for what, for, for that, for our appraisal of God's nature, is faith. Look at the last verse of, last part of verse 8. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? I used to think that that meant that, oh, some, some Christians will backslide before he comes and leave the faith. Maybe that is true. But that's not what he's saying here. What this is saying is, he's talking about the whole, look at the old parable. And then he ends it by saying faith. My appraisal of God's goodness, God's willingness to help me, my appraisal of God's willingness to answer prayer is faith, is my faith. That's why in Matthew, he said, look at the grass of the field, look at the fowls of the air, they don't toil, they don't struggle, they don't farm, yet your heavenly father feeds them. And then he said, oh, ye, how much more you owe ye of little faith. So your appraisal of God's goodness is my faith. Faith is my, my faith is a commentary on how I esteem God's goodness toward me. That's what it is. If you remember in Romans 4, it says, Abraham became fully persuaded. That what? That what God promised, God was able to do. That was his faith. He became fully persuaded. Hallelujah. Let me show you uh, one or two more things. And so, essentially, what, all I'm talking about today is God's goodness, God's um, willingness, God's desire to help me to answer my prayer. Now, in the New Testament, it is not even a question that God will hear me. The, the question does not arise that God will hear me or not. I mean, I am the temple of the living God. That's what the Bible says. And it's different from those people who live in the Old Testament. Today, I am the temple of the living God. My presence is God's presence, really, as it were. You know, and it, I, cannot, I will not pray. I, I, I like to say this a lot. I will not pray like David prayed. I cannot pray like Abraham prayed or like Moses prayed. Because the situation, their situation is, my situation is better and different from there. I live under a better covenant. I live under the fulfillment of every promise that was given in the Old Testament. I am the fulfillment of every promise because I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. In other words, where David in Psalm 51 would say, um, create in me a new heart, renew the right spirit within me. That's not me. That's not my prayer. Why? Because 7 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things pass away, all things have become new. In other words, my prayer, when I read the Old Testament, I have to bring everything I read in the Old Testament with the correct New Testament interpretation. It is not just everything there. I have to look at all those things through the lens of the New Testament and what the Lord Jesus has done. I'm a new creation. Where Moses said, if you, if you do not go with us, we will not leave this place. That's not me praying. Why? I am the temple of the living God. Me, myself. In the Old Testament, they build, they build a temple, a tabernacle. Me, myself, I am the tabernacle. I am the building. In other words, when it comes to prayer, I'm not praying Looking at God external to me. When I pray, God is inside here. I'm talking to him from here, from on my inside. John 14, 17 says, the Holy Spirit will come. I will send the Holy Spirit. That's the Lord Jesus speaking. I will send the Holy Spirit. He is with you now and shall be in you. He shall be inside you. The Holy Spirit lives on my inside now. So when I pray to God, I am praying from here. I'm not talking to him outside there. I'm not talking to him in heaven, per se. He's in heaven, Yes. But you know what I mean. I'm talking to him because I am filled with the Spirit. The Bible says we have been sealed 
with the Holy Ghost, with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's the way we see this prayer. So let me show you um, a few more things in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Again, this is all, essentially all about God's goodness and God's character. My estimation, my appraisal of God's love for me. So look at James chapter 1. And it says here, James chapter 1, look at verse 5. Actually, you know what? Let's read from verse 2. Why not verse 2? James chapter 1, verse 2. My brothers, or my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into um, diverse temptations. Things happen in this life. Things happen to people. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I'm going to verse 5. It's my focus now. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So sometimes, really, if you're in trouble, you don't know what to do, pray. Saying, ask of God, so we can see it is prayer. It's all about prayer. God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him two years later. Is that what it says? And it shall be given to him. It shall be given him. Let him ask of God that gives. I want to break this down into like four pieces. It's progressively four pieces. Look at what it says. God who gives. One, that's number one. God that giveth. God that giveth to all men. That's number two. If that was all it said, that would have been enough. He giveth to all men liberally. Liberally means generously. God's nature. That's my focus though. God's nature, God's character, God's love for us. Let me do it again. God that giveth, he gives. He's a giving God. In fact, the original, in the original Greek, it says the giving God. Who gives? For God so loved the world that he gave. The giving God who gives to all men. It doesn't just say to Christians. Hmm. To all men. And then it says he gives to all men generously. The word liberal there means generous. He gives generously. Now in the Greek... I don't know how to call the Greek word, but in the Greek, it actually means unfolded. You know that word, God is not like this. Unfolded. Table is open. Everything is open. He gives liberally. I was um, preaching the same sermon somewhere. I said, God is a liberal. I don't know if some people would like that or not. God is, he, he, gives, his, he gives liberally. Liberally. Table is open. Un, the Greek word is unfolded. Not folded. Not open. He gives to all men. Let, let me do it again. Sorry. Four, four pieces. He gives. He gives to all men. He gives to all men generously. And he does not upbraid. What does the word upbraid mean? It's, it's old English. Really old English. I, I don't think you will use that word easily in a in daily conversation. But upbraid here means he will not insult you. He will not um, find fault. He will not say, you, after all you did, you are praying now to me. Were you not warned? You were warned. You went ahead and did it anyway. Now you are in trouble, you are asking me. He does not upbraid. He will not upbraid. He will not say, but they told you. I sent Pastor so-and-so, Pastor Carl to you. You refused to listen. Now you had an accident. Now you want healing. I'm sorry. He will not say, go on. Do this first, before, then come back. Go and pay your dues first, then come back. Why is James saying this to us? Look, what, look at what it says in context again. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. God who does this, who gives to all men generously, does not operate, and it shall be given to him. Whatever he asked for shall be given to him. He is trying to convince you, trying to convince me of God's goodness. God's nature, God's character. You know, we say things like, um, I don't know if God will answer me. I don't know what the will of God is. If you don't know what the will of God is, there's no point praying. Frankly, faith begins when the will of God is known. That's a, pop that's a saying from somebody I really respect. Faith begins when we know the will of God. So, look at the next verse. Verse 6, let him ask in faith. 
So that is the person asking for wisdom. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 6, let him ask in faith. What faith? What faith? Faith? Faith that what? Faith that God gives. That God gives to all men. That God gives to all men generously. That God gives to all men generously and will not upbraid. That's what he's asking. He's saying here. Let him ask in faith. That's the faith he's talking about here. Verse 7. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Which man? The man who does not ask in faith. The man who does not ask in faith or in faith in God's nature and character. God's goodness. That man, let him not think that he will receive anything. Now, again, you have to notice something here. You have to notice something here, and it's easy to miss it. It's easy to misinterpret this verse 7. Let him not think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. It does not say, let him not think that God will not give it. Mm -hmm. In verse 5, he said, ask wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. Who gives? And it shall be given. Mm -hmm. Who gives? It shall be given. This verse 8, uh, verse 7, is not saying that God will not give it. He said, don't let that man think that he, the man, he, the man, will receive what is given. The giving part is not a question. Will never be a question. God's part is, ask, you will receive. If you ask in faith, as it's saying here, let him ask in faith. So it says here, let not that man think that he shall receive, receive, which is different from the giving. The giving is sure. The reception is the problem, is where the problem will be. Let not that man think. And it says here, a double-minded man, that man, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Who is a double-minded man? The man who says, God might say yes. God might say, that's double-mindedness right there. God might say no when I'm praying. Particularly when it comes to the things that we, have, we are guaranteed of in God's word. In redemption, our healing, our wellness, we can always trust God and believe God. Now, when it comes to the issue of, somebody offered me a job in Vancouver. Should I move to Cairo, Egypt? That's a, question, that's a conversation between you and the Lord. Should I go? Is it your will? That's, that's a conversation between him, um, you and him. Your life issues like that. Should I marry this person? Or should I not marry them? That's a conversation between you and the Lord Jesus. But when it comes to those things that are guaranteed us in God's word, there's no question. Healing will always be God's will. There is no question about it. Sickness and disease can never be God's will. No matter what people say. Never. Never be God's will. The Bible says in Acts 10, 38. Acts 10, verse 38. This is Peter preaching at the house of Cornelius. He said, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Amen. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. He went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil. Who was the oppressor? The devil. Not God. It does not say who are oppressed of God. Healing those who are oppressed by God. All those that God said, I'm going to use sickness to teach you something. I'm going to use, use this disease to, to help you learn uh, patience and something. God does not do that. That is not the nature of our God. The oppressor is the devil, full stop. God is the, is the healer. Jesus is the healer, full stop. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. In other words, everything he did had God's endorsement. He did it because it was God's will. Amen. What's my point? The big picture, I keep saying it, is God's goodness, God's nature, God's character, his willingness to answer our prayer, and our appraisal of that. Now, how do I get, um, how do I get my faith developed, if I can use that phrase? I, re I really don't like to um, put it that way. How do I get my faith developed? By looking at what the Word of God has said. I'm going to look at the Gospels. I'm going to look at all the people that the Lord Jesus healed one by one. There's not one instance where somebody came to the Lord Jesus and said, can you heal me? And the Lord Jesus said, where were you last night? What 
that thing you did two years ago, that's why you're sick. No questions asked. Not one instance. Not one instance. Not one instance. Where he said, your past has come to hunt you down. <laughs> your, past, your past has finally caught up with you. Do you remember your, how crazy you were when you were in your teens? <laughs> this is payday. <laughs> he never said that. Which shows us that he does not upbraid. Now, yo, for me, jo John 1.18 is a cardinal scripture. Cardinal. Extreme, for me, it's like a, it's like a sign post to my life. It's like, a, it's like the pillar of a house. The one single pillar. Well, not the one single, but one of the major pillars of my life. John chapter 1 verse 18. It says, no man has seen God at any time. Even though we think, we thought Moses saw him. He says, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son of the father, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has, another version says, he has made him known. Another version says, he has explained him. The only begotten of the father, the son, he has explained him. Which means that Jesus, really, the Lord Jesus, is the explanation of God. In other words, if I'm going to take a situation, any situation, any issue, and say, what will God do in this situation? The question is, what did Jesus do? You know, Jesus is the full expression of God's character. Full expression of God's nature. Now, that's, that's what um, Hebrews 1.3 also says. It says it's the exact, the express image of the Father's nature. The express image is Jesus. So when I look at Jesus, all I see is God in action. God in action, I look at Jesus. Jesus in action, that is God. That's all there is to it. So, how do I um, um, convince myself, come to a place where I get more convinced about God's nature and character? Look at the word. Just keep looking at the word. Look at the, all the examples of healing. Look at the, um, the Psalms. Look at them one by one. Your faith will develop. Now, um, let's go back to Luke 18. I'll show you something quickly. Should we end in the next 10 minutes? Luke 18. Same Luke 18 we were just in. So the Lord Jesus was just talking about prayer here. Look at verse 35. Luke 18, 35. Luke chapter 18, verse 35. And it came to pass, the Lord Jesus, as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. 36, and hearing the multitude pass, he asked what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before him rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Verse 40, and Jesus stopped and stood and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he was come, he asked them, saying, how can I help you? What can I do for you? Jesus has not changed. Every time we call upon him, that's the question. How can I help you? What's up? What's going on? <laughs> what, what, are you, can I help you? How can I help you? That is always the question. Now, even here, redemption had not happened here. You know? This guy asking for, have mercy upon me, it's not even, we cannot even say it was under the new covenant. Because the new covenant or the new testament did not start until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So we are in, in, a, in an even better place here. Look at what he says, verse 41, what will you that I shall do unto you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my, my sight, verse 42. And Jesus said unto him, receive your sight, your faith has saved thee. And immediately, Verse 43, he received his sight. No, but does it sound like the Lord Jesus said, mm, in six months, maybe you will receive your sight. It doesn't say here, um, it's your parents' sin, the sin of your parents. Or a generational curse that happened in your family 20 years ago. You know, I will never understand how Christians talk about generational curses. You, <laughs> generational curses, Christian, generational curse, that's your problem. See, these things are, you know, okay. <laughs> so the Bible talks about strongholds. And many times we think strongholds are demonic realms. 
we think, oh, there are demons. Oh, there is a stronghold of demons over Toronto. It's a stronghold of demons over cities, all over the place. Ah, in my father's family, I'm African. I'm Nigerian. I, I think I'm the proudest Nigerian alive. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> I think I am. But you hear all these things about generational curses. Your father's father's father. Something happened the, the, 10 generations ago. Uh, they have this thing. Not me. I will not insult my salvation by entertaining those thoughts for one minute. It will be a travesty. Oh, this generational curse. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What more do you want? That I am sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Don't insult me by saying, by even implying there's a generational curse. Don't insult what God has done. So anyway, people say stuff like that all the time. What I'm saying is this. There are strongholds. When we talk about strongholds, we think demons. Some devil. The greater stronghold I can tell you today is the mentalities. Strongholds in the minds of men. Oh, generational curse. Some people, no matter how many scriptures you open to them, they believe in generational curses. They're under a curse. They go, I need deliverance. Everywhere, all over, all over the place. So, there are strongholds in the minds of men. Second Corinthians 10 says, the weapons of our warfare, they're not kernel, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. But it, it doesn't just say strongholds, it says thoughts, imaginations that are, are rise up against the knowledge of God. We pull them down. That's where the main strongholds are. Can't convince some people. Same thing here about God's nature. What does the word of God say about prayer that I've showed you so far? God will answer prayer. God will answer prayer quickly, speedily. He doesn't say come back later. He doesn't say no. If you know what God's word says. But some people you cannot convince them otherwise. My last set of scriptures um, Psalm 107. I begin to round up now. Psalm 107. Don't forget that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is the Word of God. And in Him, in Jesus, we see a full demonstration of God's nature and character. Look at Psalm 107. So, Psalm 107 will illustrate everything I've been trying to say. Everything that we read in James chapter 1, God gives to all men, liberally, we don't upbraid. Psalm 107, if you read it all, illustrates everything I've been trying to say. Look at it. Psalm 107 from verse 1. From verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is... Are you with me? I want to know you're with me. For he is what? He is good. And he's what? His mercy endures forever. His mercy endureth forever. For he is good. He is not bad. <laughs> he is not wicked. The Lord is good. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. How long does his mercy? Until you sin, sin number 1000. And then he says, fine. That's, that's the end of mercy for you. No more mercy. It's, you, you had it coming. That's it. He doesn't say that. Even in the Old Testament. This is Old Testament scripture. He is good. His mercy endures for a thousand years. No. Two years. No. Until you do something right. Forever. <laughs> Look at what it says in verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say what? That the Lord is good. Let them keep saying it to themselves. That the Lord is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That the, say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Now, as we go on in this, um, this psalm, you will see, you will notice four different scenarios in this psalm. This is the first scenario. The redeemed of the Lord. Let them say what? Say that the Lord is good. Look at verse 3. He gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in their trouble. I mean, in a solitary way, they found no city to dwell in. Verse 5, they were hungry, they were thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Verse 6, then they cried unto the Lord, which means prayer. And he said, no. Is that what he said? 
and he delivered them out of their distresses. He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his what? For his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. This is a song. We sing it. I used to sing a song like this. Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his... Yeah. So, oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Verse 9. He satisfies the longing. Now, his character is being described. He satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with goodness. Such as sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Why? So this, this is the second scenario. Second scenario here. Those people who sit in darkness, in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron. Why? Because they rebelled against the word of God and contempt the counsel of the Most High. So these are really bad people. They have despised um, the counsel of God. They have rebelled against the word of God. So they deserve to whatever comes their way. Thank God that God doesn't give us what we deserve. Amen. That's what mercy is all about. And that's what we get in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at what it says here. They, they um, rebelled against the word of God. Verse 11. They contend the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their hearts with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Verse 13. Then they cried. In other words, no matter how far you have gone, no matter how bad you have been, how silly your mistakes, how terrible your mistakes, then, look at it. Then they cried. Then they cried. Even though they despised the counsel of the Most High. Then they cried unto the Lord and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. And he broke their bands in thunder. Oh, that men will praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass and cut bars, the bars of iron in thunder. 17. This is the third scenario. Third scenario. Fools. Because of their transgression, because of their iniquities, they are afflicted. Their souls abhors all manner of, eat, of meat. They draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. Same thing. They cried. They cried again in their trouble. And he saved them out of their distresses. Verse 20 is what we are familiar with. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Look at verse 17. They are fools. Because of their iniquities, because of their transgression, they were afflicted. But when they cried unto him... He healed them. He sent his word and he healed them. All that men will praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Look at verse 23. Another scenario. Scenario number four. They that go down to the sea in ships and do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. He commanded and raises the stormy wind, which lifteth um, the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. In other words, there's a sea storm. There's a um, storm. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like, like a drunken man. And they are their wits hand. And 28, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. Four scenarios. Each time they say, the Bible says, they cried unto the Lord. And the Lord delivered them. They cried unto the Lord and he delivered. They cried, he delivered. Every time. In this last scenario, it doesn't say they did anything wrong. They were just doing business on the sea. And trouble came. Sometimes you've done nothing wrong. And then there's, because you are a human being on this earth, the Bible says the devil is God of this world. You know, sometimes you're just minding your business. I, I, I like to tell this story. One day I went down to the park next to our house with my son. I think we went to ride a bike or fly a kite, something like that. Now, a pregnant woman, a pregnant mother, she's pregnant, she has a little, she had a little, like a three year old, two year old, three year old kid. And they were going to, they went to the swing. Okay, I was minding my business, but I could see what they were doing. Now, she put the little baby, the um, little kid, the two-year-old on the swing. Baby was swinging back and forth. Baby was happy, laughing and giggling. She was, okay, fine. She, she probably came out because of him, like, okay, he wants to go out today. She was pushing him, swinging back and forth. And all of a sudden, the kid leapt, for some reason, whatever reason, out of that swing, did a somersault, landed on his head. But it was okay. It was okay. But what I'm saying is, in that one moment, a beautiful situation can become tragedy. You know, sometimes you've done nothing wrong. You, you, did, you did everything right. You obeyed all the traffic rules. You did nothing wrong. Trouble comes. Same thing with these people. They were on the sea. 
The wind came. There was a storm. He says here, they staggered to and fro like a drunken man. And then they cried unto the Lord. And the Lord heard their prayer. Look at the next verse. He makes the stomach calm so that the waves of, of, uh, of the sea are still. And then they are glad because of their quiet. I hope you get the point. All these four scenarios. In these four scenarios, people were wrong. People despised the counsel of God. And yet they cried unto the Lord. And he saved them. In every situation. Hallelujah. Let me end this by saying, look at verse 39. Let's go to verse 39. Um, verse 33. Verse 33. It says, he turns the rivers into a wilderness, the water springs into dry ground. Just, just describing what God will do. Um, look at verse 42. Verse 42. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Verse 43. This is the last verse. This is the summary of this whole um, psalm. Verse 43, whoever is wise, whoso is wise, and will observe these things. What things? That the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Whoever takes note of these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Or let's put it this way, even they shall enjoy the loving kindness of the Lord. That's what it's saying here. They will observe these things. Observe these things. Observe God's mercy, God's goodness. Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Hallelujah. Observe these things, believe in these things. Hallelujah. So, we take these things, we look at all those examples in scripture. What God did, particularly what the Lord Jesus did. Because the Lord Jesus is God fully naked. Is God full in full demons, in full flight. We look at all those things, every healing... Every answer to prayer that we see in scripture, we take note of them. These things, is like building walls on our inside. They build walls. Um, how do I? They, they build, faith builds up in our inside as we meditate on these things one by one. We look at blind Bartimaeus. We look at the woman with the issue of blood. We look at um, um, the woman who was bent down for 18 years. How they were healed. As we look at these things, look at God's word. Faith rises on our inside. We become more and more convinced of God's nature, God's character, and God's love for us. And that's the way it is. Now, one more thing. <laughs> I'm done, basically. In Mark, Mark 6, the Lord Jesus gave his disciples authority to go and cast out devils, heal the sick, go and do all this. Give them power and authority. You will see it in Matthew 10 too. Luke 10 too. And, um, but there was one instance. When the Lord Jesus went up to the, um, the mountain, um, of transfiguration, he came down, and then he found that, that a man had brought his son to the disciples to be healed, and they could not cast out the devil. If you remember that, that is Mark chapter 9. They could not cast out the devil out of that boy, even though the Lord Jesus had given them authority and power, and they had already gone and done it before. They had, the Bible says they went out, healed the sick, and they came back and told him, Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name. The Lord said, yeah, I know, I know, no big deal, kind of thing. So now, um, in this instance, they couldn't cast out the devil. So he came down from the mountain of transfiguration, and he was like, what's going on? What's, what's new? And then the man came and said, I brought my son. Your disciples could not cast them out. He wasn't happy with, it, with them. He's like, you faithless people. Anyway, he cast out the devil. Boy was well. And the Bible says they went home. Bible says, when they got home, they came to him privately and said, Lord, why couldn't we cast out that particular devil? And then he said, number one, he said two, two things. Faith, your faith, and then he said something about fasting and prayer. Yeah. The answer is not, is not my focus. All I'm saying is, they were curious. They went to him Bible says, privately. Go and check in Mark 9. Privately, they came to him and said, Cast out that devil. It wasn't the first time they would ask like that. But they were curious. We should not be like, I prayed, I didn't get an answer. It must not be God's will. These guys did not say, oh, that devil did not come out. Maybe God did not want that devil to come out. Maybe the devil being there was God's will. Uh-uh. <laughs> exactly. Now, you're not getting what we call answer in prayer or a manifestation of what you pray for. 
is not an indication of God's will. That's what I'm saying. The least you can do is to go and ask the Father and say, something happened here. I know I prayed for this thing. What's up? Why is this? Why did, it, why did I not get it? Or you go and study, study one by one and find out. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And, amen. Let's pray. Um, can I pray for that sister over there? Yes. Okay. I just like to pray for I, I believe I'm supposed to pray for you. It, um, you have a particular need? Hmm? Thank God for my children. Thank God for my children. Children. Okay. Oh, that's your husband. Children. Oh, ch- oh children. Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> just. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll pray for you. Father, in the name of Lord Jesus, thank you for my sister here. Pray that your will will be done in their lives. They will come into greater light, greater relationship for, with you in the name of the Lord Jesus.